Welcome to Factory Forward, the podcast dedicated to advancing manufacturing and propelling factories into the future. Today, we are thrilled to have Eric Budd with us. In this episode, Eric Budd and Zeeshan Zia provide valuable insights into how organizations can improve their operations by applying Deming's principles and focusing on system-wide thinking. Eric also explores how understanding of different components of the system help organizations easily identify and address root causes of problems. Now, meet your host, Zeeshan Zia. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Factory Forward podcast. In this podcast, we talk about opportunities and challenges in the way of boosting productivity, quality, and safety of factory floors across America. Uh, Today, we have Eric Budd on the call with us. Eric Budd is a seasoned organizational effectiveness consultant with over three decades of experience in process management, sorry, in process improvement, coaching, and training. He currently leads as a process improvement consulting at Bud Performance Group, leveraging methodologies like Lean, Toyota Production System, Six Sigma, and the Theory of Constraints. Eric serves on the board of directors of the Institute of uh, for Quality and Innovation has, and has developed extensive curricula for the Capital Quality and Innovation since uh, 1994. He's a recognized speaker and authority on Deming Systems for a profound knowledge and uh, organizational transformation strategies. Hi, Eric. Glad to have you on the call with us. I'm very pleased to be here. And I I feel honored that you've asked me to join you today. Thanks, Ishan. Eric, so I shared some questions with you already, but, uh, you know, I'd I'd love to dive straight in. Uh, I, I love a lot of the content that you put out there on LinkedIn, a lot of the comments that you make on other people's posts, And, you know, I had a bunch of questions uh, basically, you know, coming out of that material and that that I've always been curious about. So we'll we'll, we'll dive right in. Uh, If you want, you can share slides. You mentioned that that you might have some material. Uh, Please please feel free to do so. Talk about a little bit about myself. um, And then um, I'm going to... uh, Talk, address the questions that you provided to me. I really appreciate having a list of questions that I can address. And mostly I'm going to be using um, some of the materials that you've mentioned from my LinkedIn postings and also from um, the IQI Academy that we we deliver. Um, just for fun, I've been, you know, I play with uh, um, some of the AI tools like ChatGPT. And so I generated a few uh, photos of myself as an instructor. Uh, my background, uh, I have ancestry in from Denmark. And so I obviously the Viking background is something I chose to look at. And I really do have a, a, a long lineage of instructors and teachers in my family. My sister's a teacher. My mother was a teacher. My grandmother, both grandmothers were teachers. So I feel I kind of fell into uh, teaching and, and working with people naturally. Um, We've been working with um, Dr. Deming's work for quite a while in the Michigan area. Um, He worked with both Ford and General Motors and we had, I had opportunities to uh, support uh, some of his four day seminars while he was still alive. And so it gave me an opportunity to, you know, rub shoulders with some of the people that knew him well. Um, I had brief exposures to him personally I think the deepest connection I could say I had with him is um, I had a van one time that had a plaque that said, Dr. Deming slept here (laughs) as I, as I drove him from one location to another. So I didn't have a deep personal connection with him, but um, I feel a deep personal connection in the work that I do. And certainly in the things that I uh, try and teach, I'm going to dive into some of the questions you asked me, and then maybe you can elaborate while you talk to me about um, some of these questions. Um, This question about zero defects um, and where it's failed and what are the risks to over-reliance on specifications, um, that's one of those that actually generated my introduction to um, quality uh, the way that I'm doing it today, and especially Dr. Deming's work. Um, I worked while I was going to school, excuse me, at a facility called uh, Signetics 
and we made integrated circuits. Um, this is quite a while ago, um, and certainly not at the level of integrated circuitry that goes on today. Um, I, my station was etch and etch inspect, and I had an opportunity to um, inspect the wafers as they were coming through the etch. And we took off the photoresist and looked to see what uh, leads were being uh, remained on the, the wafers and were they sufficient to meet the requirements. So we had uh, specifications that we were supposed to be following. And when I inspected the leads underneath the microscope, one of these lots, wafers came through in lots of 20. And so we had um, a, a fairly big expense sitting in, in our, our uh, work area every time one of these lots came through and one lot didn't meet specifications. So I called over a production engineer and my requirement was to inspect it and then sign off the run sheet that had, you know, maybe a hundred different steps that the, the wafers followed as I went through the factory. He looked at the wafers and, and I said, I can't sign this off because they don't quite meet specification. So zero defects would mean um, if it doesn't meet specifications, it's rejected. Well, that's one way of approaching, um, do we meet specifications? The other way is with the way the process engineer did it, is he re rewrote what the specification was so the lot could pass. And, and it was one of those moments where I thought this definition, which we were following Phil Crosby's definition of conformance to requirements is not a good definition of quality if you're willing to move the requirements so that your output matches. Um, it's a way of, of making sure that um, you don't waste money on materials that get produced or labor that get produced, but it's not a way of assuring that quality is, is according to your specifications. So when I was working at EDS, I worked we, in a division that wanted to follow Crosby's work. We brought Phil Crosby into our division he led Crosby College and uh, sometime into the um, semester, I got a call into a boss two levels above me and said, Eric, um, out of 400 people in our division, there's only one that's not doing their Crosby homework and, and that's you. Um, and I explained why and um, my boss at the time, Prudence, who's actually a good friend of mine, we, we're gonna be meeting for dinner here in a couple of weeks again. She said, um, please do your homework. I understand your reservations. Well, our division president went on to lead uh, GMAC EDS uh, account. My boss got promoted to division president. She calls me into her office. There's a red folder on her desk. I'm thinking, okay, now she has a chance to get rid of this guy who doesn't believe in quality. What she said was, Eric, every division president on the General Motors EDS account has been asked to have a quality advisor. I'd like you to be my quality advisor because of your commitment to quality. She says, I don't know what quality is. Do I walk around saying quality, quality, quality? Like, what do I need to do? Um, at the time, um, it was a relatively new field to me. And so uh, in my exploration, I've learned about Dr. Deming. They said, you need to find out about Dr. Deming's work um, that's going on. I called uh, Gallery Furniture down in Texas because they had been applying Deming's work. I talked to them and found out things about uh, cooperation, the the um, the incentives that were, that were removed from this uh, salespeople's uh, uh, portfolio, those kind of things, and realized that this is a better way of working. And so I began to um, associate myself with with Deming's work in EDS and on the GM account, and thus ended up doing work that way. And so one of the things that we run into is is you know, what happens What we have an over-reliance on specification limits and, and what problems do they pose? And one of the pieces I put together recently for our, our new, the IQI newsletter was this little piece that it's, it's just a couple minutes long. Can I show you a short little video? Yes, please. Absolutely. Okay. Now, um, I think, let me make sure I'm sharing sound. There we go. I'll try this. Here we go. We knew our competition was tough, but we weren't sure just how tough. The study showed we were good, but it showed they were damn good.
approximately 95% of companies use meeting specifications as their approach to producing quality outcomes. Often symbolized using goalposts, specifications typically have upper and lower limits. Within those limits, there is no loss of quality. Outside the limits, loss occurs. A good result is one produced between the goalposts within specifications. A bad result will be one that is outside the goalpost, even if it is nearly the same as one that is just inside the same goalpost. Results may occur far outside specifications. Other results may occur anywhere within the goalposts. Those are declared good, no loss of quality. All results outside the goalpost, whether close to or far away from the goalpost, are considered to cause the same loss of quality. An alternative to goalpost thinking focuses upon reducing variation around a target value. Quality declines when process variation is not addressed. As inspection, scrap, and rework occurs, costs to the organization, customers, and society increase. Reducing variation is a primary factor in producing two key sources of customer satisfaction repeatability, and reliability. Specifying tighter and tighter tolerances cannot produce the process improvements created when variation reduction is our focus. Recall that while the U.S. Ford Batavia plant and the Japan Mazda plant built the same transmissions, U.S. Ford transmissions had higher repair and failure rates. Measurements of the parts produced at each facility show that Ford used 70% of the blueprint tolerance, while Mazda used only 27% of the tolerance. With better piece-to-piece -piece consistency, Mazda transmissions fit together better, producing less vibration, wear, and a superior customer experience. Before the study, Ford's approach to quality was conformance to specifications or build to print. Mazda's approach to quality is found in the Taguchi loss function, focusing on reducing variation around a target value. I guess the bottom line that we learned at Batavia is that meeting blueprint is not good enough. When other such comparisons are discovered, the superior method for producing higher quality outcomes is produced not by conformance to requirements, meeting specifications, or zero defects, but by focusing upon reduction of variation around the target. We knew our competition. So, love that material, Eric. This was really cool. Yeah, yeah it was fun putting that together. And that's a, a fairly well known uh, story within the community. Um, and and the, the idea of, of focusing on um, optimal value rather than uh, specifications uh, is a version of what's the problem with zero defects, because defects are often defined by specifications rather than a target value. So one of the things we run into is how do we do this um, in our teams and with our people? You know, like the loss function seems complicated. Like how do I how do we do something like that? David Langford, who um, Dr. Deming had asked to implement his concepts and theories within the world of ed education, has a series of of uh, tool time guides. This one is from his Tool Time for Educators, and it says how do we apply the loss function? Um, in our teams. And so I use this with a simple question with one of the classes I was teaching. What would be a, um, a good, uh, perfect length of time for lunch break? And so what we did is we said, here's, here's what you, we do. We say, all right, for you, what's, where do you start to have a loss? The break is too short. What's the perfect break time? And then what's a time that is too long? And we start to put that on simple post-it notes. And we put our post-it notes up on the wall. We do a scale that says, here's how long that our break should be. And as people sketch out the, the length of time for each their each response, we can start to look at, we can count up the ways that there, there are losses. If we see here, loss ex, ex, expands or increases so we go away from the optimal value and we we can count up all the different post-its that are saying this is too long 
or this is too short. Yeah. And we can see there's an optimal value here of 30 minutes, 60 is too long, um, zero minutes a quarter, or 10 minutes is too short. And so quickly we have ourselves a loss function. We have a curve here that says, the farther away we go from 30 minutes, the greater the loss is experienced by all the participants. And you can apply this approach for a variety of different things in your teams and your settings. Really neat example. <laughs> yeah, th thank you for sharing that. That, that. That's really cool way of visualizing what you, you what what you were talking about in the previous video. Yeah. And I thought it was difficult until I participated with David Langford in one of his four day seminars for educators and learned how to do this and thought, wow, that's a great thing. I'll bring it to my my work as well. Now, you also asked which element of demic system or profound knowledge is most often overlooked in management today. And and there's there's you know, there's four areas in Deming's system of profound knowledge. His appreciation for a system is is based on the definition of a, a system as a network of interdependent components that work together to try to accomplish the aim of the system. So there's some key aspects to that definition that I think management misses in how we operate today. Typically, we operate as if we're managing parts of the system and not interactions of the system. And so focusing on the interrelationships is a critical aspect to understanding how we apply appreciation for a system. Understanding variation, of course, helps us distinguish between common and special causes of variation. Too frequently, we treat something special as common cause. For instance, you know, somebody puts a bomb in their shoe and all of a sudden everybody has to take their shoe off at the airport. You know, that's a that's an example of misunderstanding variation. Theory of knowledge, of course, is one of those things that's the foundation of the plan, do, study, act cycle. We make a prediction, we test it, and we learn from it. And Dr. Deming said, a statement conveys knowledge if it fits perfectly data from the past and accurately predicts the future. So getting better and better at making predictions is really a function of what management's all about. And then of course, psychology, Dr. Deming suggested that we un work on understanding the psychology of individuals, of groups, of society, and of change. And so those four areas are really dynamic and may, might be viewed as different levels of our understanding of, of you know, kind of like in the physical world, we go from atoms to molecules, to organs, to beings, you know, and, and then groups. So there might be different levels that we go from individuals to groups to society and then change. And among these areas, I think one of the things that we run into today is, um, I think what's missing most in management is an understanding and appreciation of the system. So those four areas, I would say this is the thing that people that I see in management practices, especially in HR systems, is they don't focus on interactions. They just focus on performance of individuals standalone. Yeah. And, and yet in the lean world, one of the things we notice is that it's always optimization of the flow and the connections between elements and people. Yeah. And so, one of the things that we look at is, and we understand appreciation for a system, we see that structure determines behavior. And what we mean by so that Eric, is- Eric, Eric, quick question there is, did, yes. did Dr. Deming, uh, was he already talking, uh, are you making this connection with, let's say, systems thinking yourself, or was Dr. Deming already talking about, was he using that terminology of systems thinking back in the day? He certainly talked about the managing the interactions right. and the interdependence. In fact, he has a conversation in the Deming Library where he uh, has a sit down with Dr. Russell Akoff, and they talk about this definition of a system and the requirement to work on how we interact with each other rather than how we work separately. In fact, wow. you know, when we look at what Dr. Deming describes as one of the problems with the way we appraise and, uh, and assess people is that we we act as if they're not part of a system yeah and his his equation for assessment of a pe people is one that um, managers think they can solve but they can't solve they have one equation with two variables mm -hmm. and we know we can't solve that kind of equation yet we do it all the time in our assessment processes 
Thank so you. he he was he has a lot of language around that, <clears throat> both in his videos and in the new economics. And this is a key concept we teach is structure determines behavior. And what I mean by that is anything that repeatedly or persistently influences the interactions in a system. So that could be uh, incentives, it could be appraisal processes, it could be um, promotion practices, it could be a variety of things that are more than just tangible structures that we we think about. So that's an important concept. And then within our organizations, you know, these are things that are actually structures that I think get ignored when we look at how do these things influence how we interact with each other. It's very critical to how we develop performance in our organization is, is optimizing those interactions. Do they help us work with each other? Or do they keep us from supporting each other? Do they help us cross organizational boundaries or do they help us stay within our silos? So there's a variety of things that we have within our structures. And these are examples of those. Then you also asked, you know, can you provide examples where cooperation among competitors have been successful? Um, well, one of the, that comes from the idea that working together to accomplish the aim of the system is real critical. So when when Deming went to Japan, one of the things he taught was you can gain um, influence and um, power by, and he didn't use those words, but by expanding the boundaries of your system. So we had people from across different industries come together and work together in ways that they hadn't before. And that was some of the power that that ended up being there or being produced there in Japan to, as they overcame the destruction from World War II. Now, there's lots of examples of, of cooperation that we have in our lives. Um, you know, we, you know and, and we don't even think of these as examples of cooperation, except when you run into something that doesn't quite fit that example, it's like, okay, well, wait a minute. I'm used to red on top, green on the bottom. If I run into this intersection and I'm colorblind, which way is green and red? You know, like that. So, you know, there's, a, there's ways of, of doing things that will <laughs> drive you a little bit crazy that's a brilliant example absolutely wow. and then of course we have greenwich mean time has turned into elements of how we uh, work with our gps systems across the planet this international uh, cooperation the metric system of course the us is one of the few that doesn't really uh, use the metric system um simple things deming used this example of of a simple battery that that is standardized you know he could he could replace a little flashlight battery anywhere on the world and know that it would work he said i might be hurt on quality but i know it'll fit and i know it's supposed to 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 work well and then of course recently you know the barco just had its 50th um year birthday and that's an example of an amazing amount of cooperation that was required for people to work together to actually provide something that worked. Now, we want to make sure that we're when we're competing, we're competing in the marketplace and not internally. And that was one of the challenges that Dr. Deming talked about with how we use motivation within our organizations. Um, you know, this is an example of a, of a co soccer coach who decided he would give an incentive to his team for scoring goals. He'd give everybody a, uh, a dollar if they scored a goal well it turned out that some of the better players started stealing balls from their own players so they could make the goal we can see analogies like that within our workplaces when we have those type of incentives at work we know that highly intelligent people are better at cooperating and more generous uh, teams that cooperate together uh, perform better um, there's a small example that we saw um, in a town new mexico called in Pie Town, there's only 186 people in this town, and yet there's two pie cafes that that exist there. And we're thinking, how is it possible that two cafes with a population this small can survive? So how do they survive? Uh, there's a video I have. I'm not going to show that one, but the, what they do is they take turns being open. So anybody who comes to town, and people actually travel long distances to come visit Pie Town, they know that I can get pie when I get there. Dr. Deming gave an example of 
a gas two gas stations service stations in his town at a nearby intersection that took turns being open at night they couldn't survive if they both tried to be open at night oh, wow. but they would take turns being open so anybody knew i could get gas at that intersection at any time of the day he learned about them because one day when his vehicle needed to be fixed one of the service stations drove up with the truck service truck from his competitor so Fine. instead of having to buy have two trucks each they could take turns if the other guy isn't using their truck and they have one out they could borrow it so they they actually shared resources that way so they could survive and do better business um in the world of deep fakes there's a variety of, that's the competition going on right now of organizations trying to reduce the issues that we have with ai uh, producing fakes um, we see um, AT&T and Verizon were sharing costs, putting up cell towers. Instead of both putting up a cell tower in the same area, they decided, hey, we can both put our equipment on the same cell tower and we can compete with our network. And then other competitors who cooperate, examples are Airbus. The Visa MasterCard system allows people to use banking in a way that they couldn't. And True Value hardware stores are like that. They have co-op people who basically are competitors, but they're cooperating in a lot of ways that they can share essentially back office operations so they can compete better on their quality and service. So here's some questions that you asked around, what's the biggest barriers leaders face in achieving organizational transformation? And there's actually several that I listed here. Um, some may be more dominant than others, but I think these all exist. One is the concept of learning debt. I, I wrote something about that in our more recent newsletter. But basically, it's the amount of the, when their learning debt occurs, when we are not investing in people sufficient so that when they need the knowledge to apply to their new positions, especially manager, management, um, people being put into management positions are very rarely trained sufficiently to be the new leader that they are. Um, that's when managed learning debt occurs is that it's too late. You know, you, you owe something, you should have been teaching people, should have been training people up and you're not doing it in time. In the academy, we have a daily teach to learn conversation. So by the time they're done with the academy, they've done 50 different teach to learn conversations around their organization about topics that they've learned in the academy. And one of the most powerful concepts we use is if you want to truly understand something, try to change it. So plan, do, study, act cycles, trying to produce improvement teaches you a lot about something that you will never learn without you trying to make a change to it or trying to improve it. So these the three learning practices are teach to learn conversations, learning cycles, and then some kind of reflection. We use mind mapping as an approach that, that has people focus on what's their understanding of theory and knowledge. And then of course, <clears throat> There's certain learning principles that we try to apply. You know, we don't give people answers. We try and have them figure stuff out first and then then learn because it actually, when your your brain is trying to make a prediction and it doesn't know what's coming, there's more neurons firing trying to figure out, is this the thing that I'm looking at? Is this the right pattern for me to assign a meaning to? And, and if you know the answer, there's actually fewer neurons firing when you're looking at something or when you believe you know the answer to something. So that's one of the key learning principles. And of course, building on a prior a foundation of prior knowledge means tr try to make some changes to things that you're already working in. You know, don't try something essentially brand new, but you can use a ladder to get to someplace new. And then when it's effortful, people, the worst thing we can do is use an assessment of, of a class that says that was too hard and think that you need to change the class when really people that give you all smiley faces because it was fun and easy might not have learned anything. And so learning that's effortful is actually an aspect of how it feels when you're learning because it's challenging. Your brain is using more energy when you're learning at a deeper level. And then of course, the reason we do teach to learn is because it, it uses retrieval, it uses elaboration and it uses practice, which are all fundamental for actually driving retention and memory. And when we hit, teach people around the organization about something, we change the context within which we are remembering and talking about something. And that concept becomes richer and more ingrained in our brain in ways that it, it couldn't, if we're just talking to 
an instructor on a screen or talking with classmates in a in the classroom. And then I have examples of teach to learn. Um, but I, I don't know that we need to spend much time on these. Basically, what it is, it's one of the more powerful approaches that we use. The thing that, that's different in our teach to learn conversations is we don't ask people to record what they taught. We ask people to reflect upon what did I learn about myself when I tried to teach this? And we know that leaders are more effective if they're, they're capable of self-reflection and self-analysis. And so the teach to learn conversation actually allows people to do that. And so we've had some people that have done been especially self-reflective. And, and you can see that these people are very capable of learning and developing in ways that some others aren't. And so it's a very powerful approach to, to developing leaders as well as to learning. So here's another aspect of the biggest barriers to transformation. And we mentioned this one, managing the parts and not interactions. So managing the individual goals is not the same as managing interactions to accomplish organizational goals. The example of individual goals is like the soccer kids scoring goals individually that doesn't mean as a team they're going to be doing better because they're so busy competing with each other. And then hanging on to how we do management. When, when Deming said management is the problem, I believe he was talking about the system of management and not the individuals. And a lot of people take that personally. Um, Prudence Cole, she was the manager who put me in my position as a quality advisor. There's Prudence. Hi. There's me in the back as a very Hi. young man. Hi. Um, when we met with Dr. Deming, she asked him, is there hope for General Motors? And his surprising response was, sometimes you just have to wait for people to die. Oh boy, yeah. Wow. Now, that General Motors that he was talking about did go bankrupt, and we have another General Motors after that. Right. Goals without a method is a problem. If people just set targets, um, that's not as effective as actually producing uh, something useful. Using the three basic questions helps you get to that. What are we trying to accomplish? How do we know it changes improvement? And then what moves can we make that will accomplish improvement? Now, I require people to provide at least seven answers to that third question. The reason we found is that when we were doing factory layouts, one of the things that I noticed is that we had everybody on the team lay out new either cells or new factory floors, seven different layouts. Now that was challenging having a group of people especially analyzing all those different layouts. Mm -hmm. However, what we noticed was that their versions five, six, and seven were much more creative than the first one, two, three, right. because now they, they got rid of the, the standard. That's how I think about stuff all the time. And now they're forced to think of something different. If people give themselves permission to give up with the first few responses, we don't get good answers. We don't get creativity. But that's why I, I use seven. And I learned that from the senseis I worked with when I was at United Technologies. Right. So again, the three basic questions, what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know it changes improvement? And what moves can we make that will result in improvement? Now, the reason we say what moves is because to improve something, you actually have to move something. And it could be physical, it could be digital. It's real critical. And then, of course, we should be asking ourselves, what's a move we can make and learn from this week, today, or even this afternoon? I mean, there's organizations today that are testing things minute by minute in the digital world. And so there's a capacity, depending on the scale that you have available to your shelves. But the, the perspective is we should be trying stuff out. We should be making predictions, testing it, evaluating our predictions against what happened, and then choosing adopt, adapt, or, or abandon the response. And then what do we do next? And then of course, knowing is one of the biggest barriers to leaders. Um, if, if we know stuff, we don't learn. Um, Kennedy said leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. So it's very critical that leaders be willing to learn. And Dr. Demings, one of his favorite quotes for me was, I make no apologies for learning. And that's when people were challenging him on, well, you said this uh, several years ago and now you're saying that. And his response was, well, I make no apologies for learning. Like he learned and you can see it in his works and his writing. And then this is very, very potent. And even especially middle managers, I think, 
suffer from fear. They're afraid of, of their own performance with their people, but also what's going to happen to their career if they don't perform well. They're, they're kind of in a vice. But um, we need to drive out fear so that everyone will work effectively for the company. And a lot of times we have HR policies that increase fear rather than reduce fear. And we need to work to drive. So that's a very, that's a big barrier to transformation. And then what strategies would you recommend to counteract cognitive biases in decision making? Well, we have cognitive biases that limit our team's progress. And so we have, I don't know if I can zoom in on this or if I need to. So we have a variety of biases that I think if we're aware of, so one of the challenges we run into, and David, Daniel Kahneman told us this, is that even if you're aware of your biases, that doesn't mean you can, um, they don't happen. It's kind of like um, visual illusions you can you can see them and you know they're an illusion but they still happen because that's the way your brain works yeah. and that's the same thing for a lot of our our thinking of how we do our thinking biases so <clears throat> excuse me status quo bias confirmation bias anchoring bias group think <clears throat> the dunning dunning kruger effect yeah. overconfidence which is very similar <clears throat> not invented here, and then uh, availability heuristic and escalation of commitment are all aspects of decision-making biases that challenge us. And, and in, in the newsletter that we talked about, you know, um, we said there's more than just people that show up in your meetings. That's what we meant is there's these biases that show up in your meetings. So the newsletter that covers this, we have this attachment that says, here's the impact as well as Here's the mitigation method. So there's some approaches that are possible that you can take to address that. And a lot of it is awareness. A lot of it is don't trust yourself. Talk to other people. Uh, look for diverse opinions. You know, don't and don't be committed to um, fast, rapid decision. You give some time to get think slowly about things, and that will help also improve your decision making. Pretty interesting, Eric. Uh, consider you know uh, for a uh, for a quality engineer or, or you know co quality leader, you talk a lot about psychology and un understanding psychology of people. Uh, I, I find it really fascinating, and I, I guess the reason for this is that you really need to change the hearts and minds of people for for a lot of these transformations that you're talking about to actually materialize. Which is why you need to understand how they're thinking. It's the source of all our actions, whatever goes. So one of the things that's really fascinating is everything that we experience is actually happening within our skull. You know, it's transferred here somehow. Uh, we make interpretations of things that happen in the world. There's a variety of things that um, no matter what it is that's occurring in the world, it all ends up being some version of, of psychology. And so that's that I think is why that's an important aspect or why it ends up being something I talk about a lot. Absolutely. Makes sense. So what alternatives to traditional performance metrics do you suggest? <clears throat> um, several years ago, Associates for Process Improvement um, put together an approach to looking at your organization, improving it while um, running it called Quality as a Business Strategy. So <clears throat> they created a book that an approach that eventually turned into a book called The Improvement Guide. Um, Ron Mullen was one of the, one of my good friends. He's passed away. That that was a co-author in that. Um, um, some of the folks that helped uh, that worked with Don Berwick. We saw his quote earlier. We don't measure the things we really care about. Um, they created Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, which follows Deming's approach in the healthcare arena. So they they developed a method that was called Quality as a Business Strategy that had five major activities. One of these major activities is measurements of the system. So information activity is one of these things that we look at. What's an important way of looking at the measures of our system that allow us to do better planning and better evaluation of our improvement efforts? So here's some examples of, of creating a family of measures that come from that. So having business perspective, customer perspective, operations and employee perspectives 
are all useful for us to look at. Now, even more important than that is looking at these measures over time and seeing how they might move up or down together in some aspects. So when we look at, for instance, you know, in this case, we have, we have revenue and people. Well, in this organization, you know, there's a real tight link between revenue and people. Um, operations, we have direct labor hours as a percentage of total hours. You know, how well are we doing as far as being, uh, it's utilizing our people effectively. Are we um, providing the training that people might need or want? And in this perspective, what's our warranty costs, you know, before or after a particular change? And so these things, that's another way of looking at how do we deliver on a family of measures. Well, here's here's the categories. However, representation should be some version of either a run chart or a control chart that allows us to see how the process that produces those measures are producing the results. <clears throat> and and I don't need to run through all this. This is just a, a highlight of the information activity from quality as a business strategy. Now, this, this question was really interesting. How do you see the future of lean with the advances in technology? You know, I, I don't have a very good crystal ball like a lot of people, you know, like I'm sure if you ask people five years ago what they thought the future is gonna bring, they would no way be describing what our world is like today. And, and Dr. Deming even um, said, that's the reason he didn't give grades because he saw grades as a prediction. He says, how can I predict what someone's gonna be like or what they're gonna be doing in 20 years? You know, I have no right to, to put that kind of an evaluation on somebody. Um, so my response to this was, you know, Lean was developed in an effort to solve particular problems. And developing better learners is our best approach to addressing problems. And, and too often, problem solving is approached first by looking for a tool or a method rather than starting to define effectively the problem that we have at hand. And even Toyota modifies their approach to things ongoingly. They will compare, you know, each, each facility is allowed to, to modify how they do work. They're not required to do the same work year after year, day after day. They're always doing opportunity. They're always looking for opportunities for improvement. What's cool about their suggestion approach is that their version of a suggestion system is someone has tried out an approach or tried a different way or tried a different layout or something different. And that's what they present is here's my, here's the results of my trial. So they're free to try some things out. So it's not like they need permission to actually, actually make a test. Their test, they're always permitted to make tests, and then they provide as a suggestion, here's my idea. Hmm. They have a very high percentage of implemented per suggestions per person across their organization. Most organizations don't have that, but it's because they've learned how to be learners, and that's the power of the Toyota production system that we call, you know, we've also converted into lean. However, too often what we have is lean as a set of tools as a toolbox rather than a way of thinking. And I think one of the powers that we have around Deming system of profound knowledge is it gives us those generalist type perspectives that overcome the fixedness that we have with specialist viewpoints. And so if you can bring that generalist perspective from the system of profound knowledge to your specialist area, you're going to have much more power in finding ways to solve a particular problem. And then what's the one thing that um, manufacturers don't do enough of to be factory forward? Well, this is also just a guess, but I think it's fundamentally one of the things we already talked about. We have to, they have to reduce our leadership debt, being, meaning they aren't training their leaders sufficiently and leadership debt represents the increasing long-term costs and risks that an organization has by taking shortcuts or failing to adequately invest in the development of leaders and managers. 
we know that the majority of managers who are being put into their next level management position aren't trained sufficiently. Both those managers and the people who report to them say that in survey after survey. So it's almost too late when you know, we, we start to recognize that leadership debt is a problem, but without having sufficient training and support ahead of time, which is why the IQI Academy is one of those places where we give people opportunities to provide, to develop leadership. It's very cool because we, we require people to find a project ahead of, ahead of the, their initiation in the academy and use that project to learn from and apply the different concepts throughout the academy. While you're doing your project, you're not only learning system of profound knowledge, quality improvement, how to chart data, how to interpret data, but you're also learning how to be a leader. And so the, the idea of trying to change something in a system requires the, op the ability to interact well with people around you. And that's a capability that you need practice with that you can't just um, be thrown into. It's very important to be able to give people leadership practice. And underprepared leaders struggle to effectively guide their teams and maneuver towards su sufficient goals. So that's why, you know, like, here's my commercial. That's, that's my one commercial for the whole thing is um, go visit qualityinnovation.org, register for the Fall Academy. Um, the calendar's there. The, it, it's tough. It's one of those things that it, it's a challenging course. Um, yeah. it's, not, it's not for everybody. However, you will learn and you will, everybody that, that completes the Academy says, I got way more out of this than I expected. Yeah. And so Eric, that's, is this, this is, is this uh, in person? Is this uh, online? Uh, I do it live online. Right. It used to be on in person until COVID hit us. We yeah. we transformed it, and now it's same number of hours FaceTime, but yeah. we do it daily for forty five minutes, and that gives us the power of really integrating it into somebody's life over a period of a couple months. I love that. No, absolutely. That's fantastic. And, you know, just, just looking at the quality of material that you've presented today, uh, you know, in, in a short period of time, you've squeezed in, I think, six, six to 12 books of material that, that uh, you know, uh, I, I think just, I, I learned a lot and I didn't, I'm, I'm sure I, I you know, I, I, there, there were some things that uh, I, while I was thinking about some ideas that you talked about, I, I wasn't paying attention to to the next set of ideas that you were talking about. But a lot of really, really interesting material, and th thank you so much for for presenting it. Uh, well, it's been fun, good. and it was fun because you know the challenge arose where you know I got the questions late last night <laughs> and said, "All right, what can I put together?" Yeah, and and so fortunately, you know, I've been doing a lot of this work, like what we've talked about for a while. And so it wasn't too hard to, to, to respond. And I enjoyed doing that. So it, you, um, I get a lot out of being able to support people. What I really love the most is the interactions that come about as we do the PDSA cycles yeah. and the teach to learn conversations, because that gives us interaction with, are you really learning this? What are you getting out of it? Yeah. What's your next step personally? And so that's, that's one of the power. And I think we're probably unique in most of the courses that teach Deming's work yeah. in how we do it, because it's a much more hands-on approach than almost anything out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, so glad to have you on, on the call again, this was an incredibly valuable session for, for, for me, and I'm sure it's going to be the same for our viewers as well. Once again, thank you so much, Eric, and would love to have you again, uh, hopefully in the next season as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for taking time. Thank you, it's been fun. And that's a wrap on this powerhouse episode of Factory Forward. If you love this episode, share it with your network and keep the conversation going on social media using hashtag Factory Forward. Until next time, keep challenging the status quo and striving for excellence. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you in the next episode of Factory Forward.